This is our last session for today. Uh, and the topic is Association Management Company, is India ready? The moderator for the session is Mr. Martin Sirk, who is the CEO of the International Congress and Convention Association. He's been the CEO since the year 2002. He started his career in general tourism marketing with the British Tourist Authority, now known as Visit Britain. Martin has worked in the UK, USA, and Asia, and he is responsible now for ICCA's strategic direction for the operation of its head office in Amsterdam and regional offices in Malaysia, Uruguay, and the USA. Uh, the panelists for this evening include uh, Dr. Ashok Gupta. Uh, Dr. Ashok Gupta was our gracious host for the evening. Many of you would have attended yesterday. Uh, Dr. Gupta is a professor of pediatrics at the SMS Medical College, Jaipur, executive director of the International Neonatology Association, Geneva, executive in the International Pediatric Academic Leaders Association, president of the Indian Academy of Sports and Fitness Medicine, chairman of the Allergy Care India. He has several, several publications to his credit. Uh, our next panelist is one of CIM Global Zone. Ambarish Paralikar, who is our Director of International Operations and the Global Lead for the Association Management Practice of CIM Global. Uh, Ambarish is instrumental in providing strategic consulting and implementation to associations across many geographies. Uh, he has worked in leadership positions in several companies, uh, the list of which is endless. And uh, being a postgraduate from the Delhi University, he is also certified under the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors and is currently pursuing his CAE qualifications. Ambarish. Uh, our next panelist is Mr. V.K. Arora, who is the president of the Karamchand Thapar and Brothers Coal Sales Limited. Mr. Arora is a graduate from the, in mining engineering from the Indian School of Mine Dhanbad. He managed the operations of the coal mines belonging to the erstwhile Thapar Group before its, its nationalization, and thereafter worked briefly in the nationalized sector as well. Sir, would you please come up? In addition, he holds the posts of Chairman of the Indian Mining Federation, President of the Indian Coal Merchants Association, and Chairman of the Mining and Construction, Construction Division of the Confederation of the Indian Industry. Uh, we are missing a panelist today, Mr. Tony Stevens, who is the president of the Australasian Society of Associations Executive due to unavoidable circumstances. Thank you very much and good afternoon and my congratulations to everybody in the room. This is the last session uh, <laughs> yeah. before dinner and a reception and I see nobody asleep. Wow. Uh, I see nobody rushing out of the door to make telephone calls. I admire your stamina, so thank you for joining us for this session. Um, now, the title of our session is about association management companies and whether India is ready for them or not. But actually, we're not going to address that rather simplistic question. We're going to expand it and try and talk a little bit more about um, the thinking behind when and when you don't outsource your services uh, <coughs> when you actually handle them inside the association itself. And we'll try and address that from a number of different perspectives, uh, from volunteer leadership perspectives, uh, from CEO perspectives, uh, <coughs> and also from the perspective of the association management side itself. Uh, now, just to give you a little bit of background about why CIM Global, I think, invited to moderate this session, um, I believe it's uh, not because I'm a great expert in the subject, but because about six weeks ago, um, ICA ran a seminar in Amsterdam, which was um, a hybrid session linked to associations and our members all over the world, talking about the subject of outsourcing. Um, and we had a very, very interesting debate, um, a lot of controversy, um, with a number of different international associations um, experts in the field, some of whom were doing a lot of outsourcing, some were doing very little. Uh, and as part of this seminar, we conducted some online um, questionnaires and surveys beforehand to ask associations and mainly PCOs, professional congress organizers who were out providing outsourced meeting services, uh, for their perspectives 
about the importance and how outsourcing actually works. And I just wanted to share with you um, a couple of the disconnects between the association community and the outsourcers themselves. <coughs> um, now, the, the first of these disconnects was about um, the importance, or not, of membership engagement. Now, when we spoke to the associations, uh, we discovered that there was a big concern, probably the biggest concern, about risks associated with outsourcing, and risks specifically about whether it would damage the relationship between the associations and their members. This was seen as a really kind of critical risk factor. And yet, when we asked the outsourcing companies who were trying to do business with associations, in general, they didn't perceive this to be any risk or any issue whatsoever. So immediately, we had a big disconnect there between the two communities. The second disconnect was that the PCOs, the outsourcing companies, tended to focus on transactional issues. They focused very much on providing cost savings, raising more revenue, providing more efficiency of a service. Now, those were seen as important by the associations we spoke to, but they were not the critical things. The associations were much more interested in outsourcing when it came to issues of quality, <coughs> When it came to areas where they lacked capacity and they wanted to expand their capacity, and the cost savings were, were nice to have, but they weren't actually the motivational factors that were driving them in this way. So anyway, I thought I'd start off by, by some introductory comments that will give you some idea of the debate and the discussions. Some of those issues may resonate with Indian associations. Some of them you may think they're not quite so, so relevant. Now, I started off by saying we're not going to actually have a debate about whether an AMC is the right route and whether, it, whether it's not the, or whether it's, you should do everything in-house. But so in order to start off, let me just quickly run through some of the services which an AMC in, say, Europe or America might be expected to provide for uh, an association client. Membership processes, finance and administration, technology provision, marketing and sales, research functions, running events, especially the logistic side of events, producing journals, publishing, uh, and even some, in some cases, advocacy and international relationships, especially where uh, uh, the AMC actually has relationships already within government or within a, a pan-governmental institution like the, the European Union. So, that's the range of services. Now, what we're going to be talking about is whether it makes sense to outsource some of those, not necessarily to give all of them across to an AMC company, because that's a very, very rare model, at least over here in, in India at the moment. So if I could start off by um, turning to uh, Professor Gupta. Um, Professor Gupta has just set up a new international society from scratch, from nothing. Um, and Along the way, Professor, um, to what extent did you rely on your own resources, and when did you feel you needed to turn to professionals outside, and what was the thinking behind those strategies? Uh, at the outset, uh, I've been into doing events for many years, and I started very early in life, and uh, one of the first meetings I did, international meeting, was almost 17 years back, and uh, this was in Jaipur. We had 5,000 participants, and the meeting was spread over five and a half days with 700 international participants. So uh, this was my first exposure. And uh, at that point of time, most of our meetings were supported by residents and the faculty and other uh, uh, consultants from the city. And uh, it was primarily uh, a big task. We would, our professional uh, life would suffer, our personal lives would suffer. And at the end of the day, uh, you really uh, are very stressed out. And this was the first time in this city that we decided to hire an event manager. And uh, the event manager now took the responsibility for all the logistics, communication. And we realized meet, uh, doing meeting was much easier. We had enough time to think about good signs. And so that at, this was uh, 15 years back when we did this. And then from there on, I've been moving on. And I went on to become the world president of the Tropical Disease Group. 
and uh, got an exposure on how things happen. And across the world, I, uh, what again uh, came as a uh, thought to me was, there were two uh, mechanics uh, operational at that point of time. Most of the work primarily was done by the association and there was some outsourcing, but there were no clear-cut partnerships that were developed. And uh, just three years back, uh, I, was, uh, I got into developing the uh, International Neonatology Association. And what you rightly asked me a question was, what was the, amount, the kind of resource that I had? Uh, from a financial perspective, very poor resource. But yes, from uh, the connect to the world, because I've been on the board of multiple uh, pediatric organizations, and I've been uh, uh, moving across meetings and addressing meetings, and had been involved in developing scientific patents. So I was fairly well established in terms of having human resource connectivity in the specialty. So what I did was when uh, I thought of developing an organization like this, uh, I, did, uh, I got into touch with one of the, uh, the PCOs, and I said, uh, can we think of doing a partnership? And why is it important to have a partner today? For most academicians, the time is scarce, and you don't really want to put too much of stress on your own life. And that's wherein we, we, I got into developing this partnership. And uh, so uh, they were doing almost everything for us, except doing the science and the uh, communication. And uh, in the very first year when we did the meeting, and uh, because what happens is when we develop this uh, organization, one thing good that happens across the world, you always find people across the world who have an uh, inclination to get into political leadership. So when I, when I wrote to almost 100 countries across the world, I got 67 uh, countries wanting to join the group. So we had good political leadership supporting the organization. But we're really looking for big science, and we, when we thought of big science, we picked up the biggest person in the world in neonatology to head the scientific program. And so this brought in a transition. And uh, so as of today, in a year's time, we have already crossed, uh, mem uh, like the last three years, we are more than 2,000 plus members and spread over 67 countries. Our experience with uh, having a professional conference, uh, uh, the PCO running the program, has been extremely been successful. So this model of uh, having a partnership, and I think <coughs> it's a, a very important message therein. One, across the world, you can be in a smallest possible city, and you can still generate an organization which the world looks up to. It's an amazing story, an amazing story. So, uh, Mr. Aurora, you yeah. have been a volunteer leader in <coughs> gigantic institutions, yeah. and also in much smaller trade associations. Uh, and some of your associations have outsourced a great deal, and some have handled everything in-house. So could you explain perhaps your perspective of, as a, a volunteer leader of how well that has worked, uh, what the thinking is behind the different decisions that are made? Is it purely about size, or are there other factors behind whether you should outsource or not? Well, I, I like to share my experience in respect of the two models with which I have worked, you know, CII, I'm, as I told you, I am chairman of the Mining and Construction Equipment Division. Every two years, we hold some very large exhibitions in which almost 30 countries come to participate here. And the, uh, simultaneously, there's also a global mining summit, which attracts something like 1,500 people from all over the world. So it's a very large event. Now, CII is a grand organization. It has a backup, fantastic backup. So they try and do a very good job out of this. We are, as, as, a, as a chairman and some of my committee members are by and large isolated from what is happening at the back end. But what we see in, in the front is that they do a very good, very good job. Their problems with CIA are of different kind. You see, the last uh, event which we held in Calcutta, you know, they like to invite politicians and uh, you know, they, they have to come for the inauguration. So when the minister, they have to come from Delhi, they choose the flights which generally have a tendency to get late. So you have a, a large hall, 250, 500 people, you know, waiting there. The minister saab has not come. So we are waiting, twiddling our thumbs for one and a half hours. And the gentleman comes and he did not have the courtesy to offer an apology. Mm. So we decided thereafter, I took the decision, from now onwards, no politicians. 
it's a brave decision which has been taken by me they have decided to back me up up to a certain extent mm -hmm. but then they said these are subject to omissions and commissions you know so i <laughs> i'm waiting to see because we have another event coming up in december mm -hmm. now there's another other model i have here which is uh, of a slightly different kind there's a mining geological mem and mineral society of india which has about 2000 members so whenever we have to organize a conference so we try and first of form form a committee see the committee you see we try to get hold of all kinds of name the important people there because the weight of the persons who are forming the committee is very good for us to collect the funds you know when we have to go to the market to collect the funds so it is uh, it is very useful to have them around there but frankly they do not contribute very much into the running of the events etc it is only a few people who are committed and dedicated to it they would lead this event so what used to happen at that time when we used to do it ourselves was that uh, you know if the things go right there will be 10 people who would be willing to take the credit for it but if the things go wrong then you are the only one holding the stake, you know, mm -hmm. responsibility. So they organized the whole event themselves? Yes. Without the initially, taking a professional yeah, congress initially. organizer? Mm -hmm. But then, after some time, the good sense prevailed on us, so we tried to give it to an, another party, mm -hmm. the event management people, and they practically did a very good job out of it. They also organized a very good exhibition, very good seminar, mm -hmm. collected all the money, and they also give you some kind of a money which is save, which is a saving out of it mm -hmm. but more importantly the members who are there in the front they apply their mind to the to the subjects of the seminar the kind of technology which has to be exhibited the kind of technology which has to be shown then your primary focus is towards the the technological part you know which is mm -hmm one of the basic purpose which otherwise getting diluted so so yeah. the core the key message there is um focus on what is mission critical for your own association and make sure that your own expertise yes. is utilized where it makes sense That's rather right. than taking phds in particular subjects yeah. and trying to turn them into meeting logistics experts absolutely so okay. we do only uh, only the 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 front the the the, the brainiest part of the work and thereafter left rest of the job is only whining and dining you know <laughs> <laughs> okay for another perspective Ambresh, you're responsible for cim global's association management um, services division um, could you give us the your perspective on how attitudes to outsourcing have changed over the last three to five years amongst the various associations that you've come into contact with both your existing clients, but also perhaps the, the people that you're talking to who are the ones who are more reluctant to work with people for providing outsourced services. What's the general overview in the, in the marketplace? Well, we would love to have people like Mr. V.K. Arora as clients because they let us do our jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, more often than not, uh, I think association management in India has been restricted to uh, conference management or, or conference organization, which we offer rather than actual managing an association or part of their services. Mm -hmm. Specific to India, I think uh, the full service for association management, which is available in the West and in Europe, will take a long time in coming. I think there will be bits and pieces which uh, will be offered as services by us, and that's the trend which we see. We see a lot of membership engagement programs which we would be running. And of course, uh, the conference is at the end. But then uh, out, outsourcing the secretariat itself is, is a trend which we now see uh, happening more and more. We also see that uh, volunteer members, given their paucity of time, are unable to actually devote the necessary relevant amount of time that is needed to actually run the society or an association with uh, a greater deal of success and efficiency. Mm -hmm. We also now see uh, associations and a lot of international associations who have lo local Indian chapters have uh, demarcated the roles of their volunteer members clearly and restricting them to the, the content itself and they're letting professionals like us actually manage the logistics 
and everything associated with it. Because we also bring in technology, because more and more we see technology playing a very vital role, uh, whether it's association management or even uh, managing their conferences and annual, annual events. And uh, as a professional pro conference organizer, we already have those systems and processes in place, which all the associations and societies can actually use and optimize their, their revenues out of that. So that's, that's the trend which we see now happening more and more. Okay, interesting. Very interesting. Uh, the, the, one of the points that you just raised about um, the current perspective being that outsourcing is primarily an issue for meetings management uh, is something which in the West has shifted already quite dramatically. And certainly the debate that we held um, six weeks ago, this came up very, very strongly, that increasingly the associations are being forced to look at just about every service. Um, what's happening is that the competitive pressures uh, and the speed of change in the marketplace are such that they're no longer able to keep up with what's happening. Um, so, for example, I, and I don't know if this resonates with, with all three of you, but issues such as um, database management, website development, uh, and especially interactive website development, um, and certainly a, a certain amount of a technical publishing capability, are all issues that now associations are increasingly st starting to outsource. Yeah. Is this something that's happening in India as well? Or you perceive it will happen? Well, I think uh, what the point that you raise is uh, very, very, very valid because one of the reasons that we went on to another point that you had raised earlier, that uh, the only problem that we're facing uh, with the, uh, the core, core PCO is when you talk of looking for a venue for a meeting, they always, they always are focused on uh, a country or a city where you can uh, get a hotel at a less price. And uh, they're trying to look only for those areas which have a touristic interest. For example, when we were proposing Oxford as a venue, uh, the core PCO was fairly cold with that because Oxford doesn't have big hotels and other things. So certainly, uh, that's one point. Sometimes you really get into trouble with the core PCO. And, uh, so. Well, I, th I think that for, for those who are interested in that topic, that's going to be discussed in quite a lot of detail um, in the session that I'm one of the panelists for tomorrow when we talk about the nature of associations. Uh, and what I would say just very briefly is that there is a big trend over the last 10 years amongst destinations to move from a tourist-centric marketing strategy to one which is much more built on economic development priorities and intellectual capital creation. So I think that the problem that you're facing is increasingly going to be less of a, a problem because the smart PCOs are plugging into this new shift in thinking in the destinations. Um, certainly I know that, that some countries have, have even, I know certainly in Germany and Japan, that there is now a national strategy to push meetings with certain expertise into those cities where that expertise is strongest within the country. So there's actually nat national strategies are emerging. But that, that's, that's by the by. Um, before we carry on the discussion here, I'm very conscious that whilst there is a lot of knowledge on the stage, inevitably in any conference there is always a much greater amount of collective knowledge and experience in the room itself. And so what I would like to do for the next seven or eight minutes is ask you on your tables to have um, a discussion amongst yourselves to talk about any examples that your association has experienced recently of outsourcing any of your key functions. Whether it is a successful outsourcing or an unsuccessful, it doesn't matter, but please share your views on that. If your, your association is not currently doing any outsourcing, then feel free to raise the issue of is there something that you're doing which you are considering outsourcing so that the people on the table with a little more experience can actually give you some feedback? After we've spent seven or eight minutes of you talking amongst yourselves, that will stimulate you in thinking about questions relating to those topics you would like to ask us to comment on. So at that stage, we'll move on to Q&A with the whole room. So please uh, take the next seven, eight minutes. Please share your experiences with your colleagues. Ask questions if they've got more experience you want to share. And then we'll go back into Q&A session afterwards. OK? Thank you very much. Good. OK. Yeah.
that gives us a little bit of... Ah. Yeah, that's a good way to start. Are you happy with that so far?
Um, la ladies and gentlemen, okay, we, we've, had the, uh, we've had our time around the table. I hope you found that interesting. I hope you managed to share some, some useful insights. Uh, before any of, I ask my panel to comment on any, any issues at this stage, could, let's have some questions. I know that in previous sessions we've had a sea of hands go up, so I'm sure that you have some. Uh, do we have our girls with the, uh, the microphones ready to hand? So, would you like to ask our panel any questions or comments about, here we go down at the front on outsourcing. Yep. In the Indian context, we find there are some, some core activities like uh, interfacing with the government on advocacy issues mm -hmm. or uh, there are conflicts within the membership mm -hmm. on a particular issue. Now, we can't, we can't visualize these being outsourced. So, no. I, the question is, uh, how does it happen in the West? Hmm. You know, we can outsource payroll, we can database management, website. Hmm. Uh, that's not, a, that's uh, not an issue at all. Uh, this is one of but those. Advocacy and membership conflicts, mm -hmm. uh, those are things which we can't visualize being outsourced. Okay. Um, well, I, I don't know of any association where there is not some conflict somewhere. That's a, the starting point. Um, so how does the how well, does no, 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 uh, let me, let West me get handle this. it? The, that tends not to become the responsibility of an AMC. They're dealing with more standardized issues. But I think that when it comes to advocacy issues, um, the only area that a, a, an AMC can be helpful is in those areas where there is a consensus within either the industry or within the association. Oh, oh do you want to make a comment on that, um, Alphonse? Yes. That's, 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 yeah, being based in Brussels and doing a lot of advocacy work uh, towards the European Union for various associations who are in quite close areas is two things. One is that you may have different staff working for the different association clients. That's what we do. And secondly, we're very transparent to, of course, not only the association, but also the other side, the government, that we are with a business card and everything representing that particular industry or profession in advocacy. So it's, it's a very, very transparent business model and having been 25 years in Brussels, 40 years in Washington and now 10 years in Beijing, it works that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question over, over here at the front. 
Specifically, I don't have a question. Uh, as you said, this is an experience which I wanted to share. Uh, I have organized conferences with uh, the help of the professional like companies as well as uh, we manage the conferences with uh, our volunteer base. As IEEE being the largest professional organization, so we have a lot of volunteers too. But these days I will certainly say that uh, like, uh, professionals do not find that much of time by, with, with which they will be like performing all the duties of their academics or industries and at the same time they plan a conference and they do each and every logistics and uh, technicality and all those things. So that's how we, we, we were provoked to like engage a professional company as well. But the problem is like uh, most of these prof professional companies which uh, assist the conferences and all, um, they are not very well aware about the organizations itself, the style of working of the conferences, what is, what is the expected output and all those things. So sometimes the conferences uh, like uh, are a big success because we associated the professional organizers, but sometimes it becomes an embarrassment at the end of the day when you have each and every technical content ready, you have uh, excellent speakers on the board, you have everything. But again, the responsibilities of logistics, sponsorships and all those things which you expected from the professional organizers, they tend to fail or they, 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 they do not meet the expectations. So mm -hmm. apart from having everything on the board, still you face embarrassments sometimes. So what we are doing nowadays is… So you have a, a question or is No, it, I don't have a question. Okay. Oh, okay. I don't have a question. Okay. <laughs> so what we do nowadays is like uh, we have a special committee in the conferences which we organize which looks after all the professional organizers which uh, the services that they are providing. So now the communication becomes too easy and the hiccups becomes low. So what I have, uh, what I, what I have to say as a comment is like even if some organization or association is uh, like associating with some professional organizers, they should have a committee who is responsible for communicating, not each and everybody from the mm -hmm. chair or st uh, steering committee to publications committee. So it's a hybrid I'm, I'm, model. I'd yeah. like to add Ambrush, you I'd want like to comment? I'd like to make a comment here. Is that uh, it's fantastic that you have a committee in place now because in the past we have had multiple stakeholders to answer to. And uh, as the saying goes, too many cooks spoil the broth. And I'm sure that must have been the case in a few cases where you, you know, where the professional conference organizer has had to actually reply or respond to multiple stakeholders within the association. And just to take on to a point which was early made earlier, with respect to, I think Nalan made that point, uh, uh, was with respect to, you know, outsourcing certain secretariat services or resolving membership issues. I think one of the reasons why a lot of uh, outsourcing is encouraged oh. now is also because it just takes away uh, a lot of the ego issues between council members, governing board members, you know, a secretary general not giving a, a letter which it has to be sent to a parent organization in the United States to the president and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it just takes uh, all these uh, situations out of the equation and uh, the secretary is run in a very professional manner. Professor Gutter, do you want to comment on your relationship with the, the agency that you work with? Yeah, in that uh, sense? We have very clear uh, uh, divisions and where it's a membership issue, we have a governing board. And governing board has uh, three important areas to work on. One is uh, the membership, the second is uh, the ethics, and the third is the scientific program. So all, all our issues regarding uh, membership come to the uh, board and these are being resolved there. So we have uh, uh, not had a problem with that, yes. And I, I think uh, uh, another very important point is that um, the volunteer leaders, the board of directors, um, have to take responsibility at the time of the strategic decision making about how they're going to work with the outsourced partners. Um, a lot of the mistakes I see are where the board gets involved later in the process and gets involved in micromanaging the relationship. Um, it has to be clearly set up how that relationship is going to work at the high level so that everybody knows where they stand. We, we had a question there in the, in the middle, question, ladies. Question here. Got a microphone? Sorry, can we? Sorry, we can't hear. Just okay. It's working now. It's working now. I think. Hello, is it nice to be Well, I want to share information 
All India Management Association is setting up on Section 20 by companies. That is what is under the Indian Com Companies Act. It's a non-profit uh, organization in the, the and as a company mm -hmm. for outsourcing some of the activity like is skill, skill development. I suppose this model can be replicated. So I'm, I'm not sure I really heard. Will you please repeat the thing? Well. Uh, the, what I'm saying, the skill development provides for also section skill 20. Development. Skill, yes, development. Skill, skill development. Skill okay. development. Section 20 way company that under the Indian Companies Act is a non-profit, what is called, organization. It doesn't totally, it's okay, it, was a com it is not commercial, it's mm -hmm. a company, it's a corporate status it has got. It's a company, uh, one of the associations is setting up a company under section 25 to deal with certain activities. Ah, so, you, so you're talking about the internal structures within associations where there is a division between the not-for-profit activity and a for-profit activity. Well, I think, um, yeah, that, that model does exist amongst associations elsewhere, um, often relating to the meetings activity. Um, certainly in some countries, there's a for-profit uh, entity that runs the, the meeting and a not-for-profit that looks after the scientific or a foundation versus a, a, a profit type operation in the States. There, there are many different ways of carving that up. It's not directly re relevant to the engagement with an outside company that effectively is a for-profit entity, pulling it up. But it's another, it's another way of an association uh, approaching the issue. Uh, and Perfect, we won't, we won't cover that anymore. Okay. Uh, another question over here, yes. Yeah, question. I'm or comment. Ayapan from IEEE Bombay section. How can an association management company help with respect to sponsorship? Let's assume for con conference organization. When we have to approach for sponsorship, the sponsors obviously will not respond to mails from your association management company. I mean, if I write from, I, uh, from IEEE on, with Sorry. that IEEE ID, I get a response. Even that is very difficult to get responses. Okay. So this is a challenge we face. That's so. so how, that's a how how theoretically can an AMC or PCO help with sponsorship raising? Actually, for a lot of PCO companies, in my experience, the ability to increase revenue from other partners is one of the biggest selling points that many of the PCOs actually put forward. So, yes. uh, and the reason why they put that argument forward is that they are working for multiple associations, often within related fields. And so they can actually add the relationships they have with other companies to the relationships that already exist and are working very well between the association and their existing uh, commercial partners. So that, that's how... So In would, fact, uh, the, the model which I was describing uh, recently, now there the president has to write letters to all the parties there. Thereafter, it is the job of that person to follow it up with those people, chase them, do give them the kind of, uh, you know, yeah. the response they are looking for. And thereafter, we have realized that the kind of money he is able to raise by his constant chasing is much more than we were able to raise. Mm -hmm. And it's become, probably become easier for us to get sponsors now yeah. on a sustained basis mm -hmm. than it was earlier. Yeah. And in fact, as, as long as you have a transparent relationship with yeah. the agency, then both parties can, can win out. Uh, it can actually be a way of reducing your, your, your costs of the agency if the agency is on a, some kind of shared revenue relationship. That, so there are many different ways of actually dividing that up. Now, this was based we on the experience with three conferences where we... We didn't really it, it, of course, it doesn't, it, it doesn't always work, but I'm talking about the theory here. Obviously, very importantly, you need to have the different relationships between the guys having the political relationship and the people doing the functional activities. But yeah. Professor Gupta, you want to? Yeah, I'd just like to add on to that because uh, we've had, we are into a partnership with the uh, company. And uh, they, uh, on their own, they have a big network with the industry. And uh, I think almost 70% of our revenue was generated by the, the uh, partnership company. Mm -hmm. And uh, the remaining 30% was uh, based on our academic strength and we were writing it. And so we always work as a collaborating group. It's not that uh, uh, we are trying to text them or they are trying to text us. It's a collaboration and everything is clearly spelled out. We have a clear MOU on what is, how do we share the revenues? Because ultimately, when you run an institute, organization, you need finances. Okay, we had a question yes. there in the middle. Yes. Here I have to put only one say. Recently in Chennai, we had a 
Indian Drug Pharmaceutical uh, Drug Manufacturer Association, we had an exhibition for three days. Mm -hmm. When we planned, we felt that uh, we may be losing money. And we took the advantage of a event manager. They were able to help us in getting lot of stalls and whole exhibition was full and we could get 25% of the uh, profit. We got almost 10 lakhs rupees out of it. Congratulations. Earlier, <laughs> we were planning that we may be losing 5 lakhs rupees. Good. Thank you very much for a very, a very positive statement. <laughs> um, right at the back, let's, let's, let's ask uh, somebody who... The, 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 I feel the people at the back are missing out because the microphones are too easy at the front. <laughs> no, I thought there's okay. no, you start feeling that there's no representation for backside, but we are still awake, don't worry. Uh, my question is that there is a challenge in identifying the right association management services because on paper everybody claims to be very good that is one mm -hmm. secondly till you work with them you don't know and when you enter in contract it's difficult to go back <laughs> because this because everybody is saying positive there are negatives too mm -hmm. because we did couple of events some were positive some were negative my earlier uh, association mm -hmm. but paper they were looking so great and we thought we'll do very good Business models were worked out, the anticipations, what revenue were worked out, and end of the day, of, after three days conference, it did not give any results. But that management service got their money because of services, but normally penalty clause they don't accept. Let me tell you that. Mm -hmm. If you don't give me this, <laughs> what you will give me? No, nobody accept that. <laughs> Correct? So where we go as an association, because we are accountable to our members. That's what I just want to open I it think on that. in the first place you perhaps go to a professional, uh, professional That's what I'm saying on paper, all are professionals. Yeah, but the reason <laughs> is that you go to a company, let's, let's, let's leave the professionalism aspect aside, because perhaps you perhaps don't have the in-house strength to execute it, or you do not have the confidence to execute it. That's the reason you, you try and seek outside assistance in the first place. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that answers your question. With respect to your previous organization, I think we're perhaps using the wrong vendors. I think they're making the be better choice now. Hey, Ekman, that's a bad experience. That's what I want to share. That, but we learned very hard way. <laughs> I, I think um, it's very important for the leadership of the association to draw up clear parameters of what it is that they're trying to achieve, first of all. So if it's a, a deficiency in a certain area or if it's the need to move into a new, new marketplace or to develop new events yeah. or to develop new revenue streams, that has to be clearly set out. I think uh, a lot of the mistakes occur, or, the, or the disappointments occur because one or both parties are not clear about what it is that the objective is that, that is trying to be met. I'd like to make a point here and it addresses what Kaushik is saying as well as what Mr. Mayapan said. And I think uh, for every association and society, I think, they would, they, I think uh, the, the best model is the model of partnership where a proper sponsorship development plan, because I think Kaushik's question is also somewhere uh, related to revenues which uh, perhaps never uh, you know, materialized from what was expected or anticipated. Now I think that sponsorship development plan has to go hand in hand along with the AMC. Mm -hmm. So that it's clearly understood, expectation, expectations are clearly defined. And I think uh, working together is the only way forward because as Mr. Arora also said that an AMC writing uh, letters of sponsorships doesn't really work. It has to be the parent organization for which we are actually working, who, who actually front ends this, and we actually do the follow up to ensure that the results are as per what has been, you know, marked out. Yeah, absolutely. There, there, yeah. Is, there is no simple way of passing on responsibility to a third party. Yeah, that's what it happens. You can't, you can't do that. You, in you have to be engaged in the process. So I'll tell you what happens, the leader finalizes everything, but the below staff, they feel it's not their, it's not their responsibility. It's sort of management services. Yeah. So I, they go away from that and yeah. they don't support so much the way they are supposed to support. Yeah, I think, I think any, any company that entirely outsources and leaves the company to, to deliver on a, a, a wild promise is going to lose out. Um, you have to be engaged and work in partnership. And certainly in our survey that we carried out, the word partnership was the one that was most often used by the associations we were talking with. They were not looking to actually simply have a, a, a transactional relationship with someone who could do something cheaper or faster or a little bit more efficiently. They wanted to work closely 
to a, to a shared objective. And that, that's a real takeaway for, for everyone if you're planning to look at this area. Sorry, yes. Uh, my question is related to uh, association management other than conference. Yep. Uh, what we have, uh, the basic topic, that is suppose uh, we want to outsource uh, services like uh, marketing through online marketing, mm -hmm. which is a very big need for any association, I believe. It's reaching out to more members, more people, and also uh, any association, I don't know about others, at least our association has three or four verticals which are generating revenue. Mm -hmm. Now, if we can do marketing properly, if you have wider reach, then you can have more revenue. Mm -hmm. I, my question is whether in USA or elsewhere, the, uh, these outsourcing agencies, wherever mm -hmm. it is, are ready mm -hmm. to work on a revenue sharing basis, not cost sharing, I'm not on cost basis. Uh, do you come across uh, any such you know, agency who is ready to outsource, to be outsourced on a revenue sharing basis? Um, I, I have heard of models like that, but I would counsel against doing something which is purely about revenue sharing or purely about commission on sales. Uh, and the reason for that is that if you are trying to get professionals in, there is a certain cost to their services. Now, it might, the model might include incentives and revenue sharing as part of the deal, but I would always, uh, personally, I always don't really trust people who say it's going to cost you nothing. I'm, we'll take it off the back end. Um, I think if people are offering a truly professional service, you should be willing to pay something towards that. Um, I think it, I, I'm not sure whether my, my panelists it, would it agree. I think it also depends on the nature of the relationship with the client. Uh, the nature of engagement with the client. If the client has uh, engaged in AMC for uh, an extended uh, array of services, then something like that can be bundled. Mm -hmm. And I would actually like to draw out an opinion from two people sitting on the table right there, uh, Alphonse and Arlene, as to what their experiences or what their observations for uh, a model like this in the United States would, would, would be. Uh, Oh, it should come through. Nope. Nope. Not yet. <laughs> Nothing yet. Yeah, there we go. Yep. Okay. Um, I think, Martin, uh, you touched the right point. Um, is that there there has to be skin in it. There has to be challenge in it for the management company, um, particularly in a in a developing stage, it's, it's fair enough. Um, but not the entire ship, that doesn't work. Um, the revenue sharing could be uh, indeed in membership. It will be very difficult to paraphrase my other example in advocacy, because the outcome of advocacy is really, really difficult to predict or to put a milestone in when legislation is adopted. So I see that very, very little. So it depends on the type of service and uh, the arrangement, but I would say for certain services, it, it could definitely make sense. Yeah, I, I would agree, except, um, or maybe and, like so many things in associations, you know, there's always a sort of, it depends. Um, so on the revenue sharing, uh, something that would really concern me, I would want to really um, fully understand how is the, uh, partner or the organ of the entity being uh, incentivized. So yes, maybe they would deliver more revenue, but in a way that um, either uh, uh, detracts from the, the quality of the event or the activity or that doesn't have um, the benefit in the long run. So if they're going to be bringing in more members, you know, maybe they're doing that through some kind of a short-term cost-cutting campaign um, and they get a lot of members, but they're not going to be staying with you. If they generate more revenue out of an event, um, is it because they've cut back on some of the quality aspects mm -hmm. of what people yeah. want in terms of exactly. a good event? So I think you have to be careful about that. Mm -hmm. And I think someone on the uh, panel said, um, if you are engaging the services and the knowledge and expertise, 
of uh, an entity or an individual that you need to accomplish your work, there is a market value associated with that. And paying the entity for the quality of their knowledge and the work that they're going to do uh, is oftentimes, I think, a better model. Yeah, I, I, I think okay. that goes back to some of the introductory points I was making about many of the associations being much more focused on quality issues and capacity issues rather than simply a, 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 a cheaper deal. So we have one more question there. Then I think uh, um, I don't see anybody from SimGlobal telling me when we should wind up. But should we be winding up any <laughs> second now? No? Can we another question over there? I'll keep going until you tell me. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm a director of the EU India Chambers based in Mumbai. And I've been hearing a lot of discussion of uh, outsourcing. So I just would like to share our experience also, like, you know, as some gentlemen said, they have a good experience. Some of them said they have not so good. It's only on the paper. Just I was wondering, like, you know, we also have these kind of experience. Sometimes it is good, sometimes not good. Can we think of having a, some rating agency, which, you know, which would be going to rate the performance of these event management company that will also give the score for event management company to perform good, not only on paper, even on, you know, actual. Can we think of something like that? Because in many fields, we are coming up with a lot of, uh, you know, rating agency. Now, real estate mm -hmm. is also thinking of, can we think of something like that? Thank you. I, 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 I hear what you say, and I think if we wait to see it, we could all get very old before we actually do. Um, the, the, the challenge with any sort of rating issue is about transparency and honesty and scale. Uh, the reason that a lot of the restaurant and hotel rating websites work is that they have scale. And so um, bad reviews or deliberately bad reviews will become balanced by the rest of the reviews. So you can generally trust if a hotel has got 300 reviews that you can, you can get a general feel for it. With association management companies or professional congress organizers, you're talking a much smaller audience uh, and uh, an audience where um, even writing a good review is not something that is very common. So to, to put, create a platform where somebody would be willing to write publicly a bad review, I, I don't see that happening. What I would say, before I, Anfon's comments, uh, I can see him itching, um, is um, one of our pieces of advice to any association that is looking to hire a PCO or outsource some of their other services is to ask the, um, to ask the AMC or the PCO to give the names of some clients who they are working with in a similar way maybe a client which is of a similar scale to yours or has a similar geographical reach or covers a similar um, academic or trade area. So that, and if they are good, they will give you the email of their key people and let you have a conversation with them. Uh, and that is probably more valuable in terms of assessing the relationship than any sort of public website or transparency. Thank you, Martin. Uh, excellent points. I only add there is an AMC Institute in the United States because it's a very developed, res reasonably developed market for AMCs. So there is an AMC Institute that accredits uh, companies. So that's an extra level, but I do agree with the points you made, Martin, about references and experience. So, Okay. So I think we're, we're just about, yes, thank you, nodding, nodding. So it, it remains only for me to thank my esteemed uh, colleagues on the panel for your great expertise and for contributing, and especially for all of you for being such a fantastic audience, staying awake, not throwing anything, having great questions and discussion. Thank you all very much.